So this is our talk on uh, mastering Git. Uh, start off with um, thanking our thanking the sponsors for uh, sponsoring the event so that we can all be here today. Thanks for feeding us. <laughs> so, um, a little bit on uh, who we are. I'll let you. All right. Go first. Sure. Uh, I'm Ryan Richter. I'm a senior support engineer at Chocolatey Software. Um, I'm pretty much at Ryan Richter 94 on all the social medias, as you can see there. Um, I consider myself a little bit of an intermediate Git user um, from the perspective of this talk. Um, I use it in my day to day, but not so much as our development team and some other people. <laughs> <laughs> some other. Um, and I'm uh, Corey Knox. Uh, I'm a software developer at Chocolatey Software. Uh, prior to Chocolatey, I worked uh, doing end user computing support for a tire retailer in Canada um, and I've used Git, um, pro I guess, professionally for the last five or so years um, and uh, unprofessionally uh, for the last two or so weeks. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> no, just, I, I have used Git uh, quite heavily um, and uh, and been using it and learning more about it um, just as I just do everything. Um, I'm not as, as smart as Ryan. I don't have uh, the same handle on every single social, uh, but it is either CoreBob or some variation of uh, Corey Knox or in the case of LinkedIn, Knox Corey, because some other jerk named Corey Knox took the way I want it, so um, we'll start with a bit of a, a full disclosure. Uh, Ryan and I both work for Chocolatey Software, um, but this is not the views of Chocolatey Software. Uh, these are our preferred methods of using Git, and there are definitely more ways of using Git than what we're gonna uh, cover and, and learn about today. Um, there was something else I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to make sure we cover, but, um, oh yes, um, so so while we work for Chocolatey, this isn't their views, and it's not necessarily um, the way that, that everyone at Chocolatey uses Git. Um, a lot of it comes from the way that we use Git at Chocolatey, but um, that's sort of that. You do the We're slightly slide. corrupted, but we'll show you <laughs> how we do it. <laughs> so, do you wanna cover? Questions? Yeah, um, we're gonna be covering a lot. Uh, if there's something that, that you need assistance with uh, throughout the presentation, just put your hand up or you know, just audibly say, hey, I need, you know, I need assistance or whatnot. We'll be happy to come around and help you as we work through the workshop part of this. And um, any questions, that, um, we will re repeat them for the recording um, so that they're uh, able to be picked up for the, in the recording. Um, and so I will move on into the the uh, workshop if I learn how to use the clicker properly. Um, so the workshop objective that was uh, may or may not have been written by ChatGPT um, says that Git is a powerful version control system used in DevOps to keep track of changes in files and collaborate with others efficiently. Uh, now. What, is, what does that mean? Um, we're not entirely sure, because uh, like most things in AI, it just kind of makes things up. Uh, but I would take it to mean that uh, in order to be efficient, you need to know all of the commands that are in Git. Aren't there quite a lot of those? How many are there? That's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, how, ma how many? Uh, if we go according to the documentation, uh, there's, there's a handful, and they're kind of split up into uh, various buckets of, of based on what they do. And so there's, uh, there's the porcelain commands and the plumbing commands. So the porcelain is kind of what you interact with, and the plumbing uh, is what the porcelain interacts with. Uh, they apparently have decided uh, to model it off of a bathroom, and I'm just realizing there are so many <laughs> 
<laughs> There's so many things I could, I could observations I could make about that. <laughs> um, now, in these two buckets, there are smaller buckets because it's buckets all the way down. Uh, under porcelain, there's main, uh, which are the commands that uh, are the main commands. Uh, then they also have ancillary commands that uh, do ancillary things. Interacting, interacting with others uh, is a bit of a misnomer. It's not actually interacting with other people. It's interacting with other uh, version control. And then under plumbing, uh, they fall under manipulation, interrogation, uh, syncing, and internal helper commands. I just realized I didn't hit start on my timer. So we're gonna be a little late for a break, maybe. Um, and so inside of these, these buckets, uh, there are 44 main commands, uh, 29 ancillary commands, uh, 10 for interacting with others, 20 uh, for manipulation, 21 interrogation, uh, 11 for syncing, and 18 for the internal uh, helper commands. Um, and so that begs the question of like, really how, how many, many? How many are there? Um, and so it turns out by my count of those, um, and you'll get different answers depending on how counting works apparently, because uh, <laughs> I've seen talks where they, they didn't get the same number. Uh, there's 153 commands. So that seems like way too much to cover in this talk, Corey. Yeah. Some, some might say that it's, it's, it's too, too much. much. So, um, so then if that's too much, uh, how many do we want to, or how many are we going to cover? Well, so we've got the, the plumbing commands um, that has 70. And as I said, that's the porcelain interacts with the plumbing to do the, to, uh, to do what it does, um, and so we're we won't talk about those at all, and nor interacting with others because as I said, others is a bit of a misnomer. It's interacting with other version controls, uh, and we're, we're you, don't, you don't really that. do that often, yeah. um, or at least I haven't found the need to do that. Uh, so that leaves us with I should have counted this before seventy three. Um, I did count it before, <laughs> uh, but 73 still sounds like a lot. Uh, so we're actually gonna say three uh, for the ancillary commands and 21 uh, for the main commands. So uh, that brings up to the, us to the, the next part, which is which commands are we gonna cover? If there's 153 and we're only covering 44, it's good to know which ones they are. So we'll go over uh, config, which is used to configure Git on your system. Init, which is, this is going the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> so init, which is used to, to initialize uh, your Git repository. Uh, ch checkout, which is used to uh, move around in the repository, check out files, check out branches, uh, and various things in the repository. Status. Basically get where you're work, currently working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, this is, I, I made a change to the slide this morning and now it is bringing these up in a different order. Um, <laughs> so, um, so add, which is used to add files into the uh, index which we haven't covered, so it doesn't make sense that I'm telling you about add right now, but we'll just keep going with it because <laughs> that's how it works. Um, we use commit uh, to commit your, your changes. Uh, log to, uh, shows, you, shows you the history of your uh, repository and the messages that are on all, all of them. Hey, show. Corey. How about git show? We just show them the rest of the commands. Um, we'll try. Okay, let's do it. Because what's supposed to happen is it's supposed to show you all of them, and it's not. <laughs> so uh, pro tip, if you're uh, speaking, 
uh, test it and don't make changes Last 15 minute. minutes before your talk. Um, so those are all the commands that we're gonna cover. Uh, there is 24 of them. Uh, it was originally supposed to go across the top and then uh, to there, which is why I got confused by all these ones. Um, <laughs> but, you know, do it live. Um, so, so these are the commands that we're gonna cover. Uh, so what, are, what does our rough plan uh, look like? I'll let you cover the rough plan, because. Of course. Well, uh, we have a little bit of story time with Corey here about yep. version control systems and how all of that in the before times, we'll call it, uh, before Git. As well as we'll cover uh, what is a Git, why is Git, okay, but which Git, installing Git, using Git. There's a part this, we really don't know. We're gonna make it up. Which apparently we're making most of this up anyways. Exactly, so. do it live. It's perfect. <laughs> and then of course, lastly, you have profiting the Git. So, so then uh, naturally that means that is story gonna, time. Exactly. Story time with Corey. Um, so so to, to understand what Git is and how to use Git, you kind of need a backstory, or maybe you don't, but I'm gonna pretend you do. And I'm the one leading the, the workshop, so I get to decide. <laughs> so uh, the backstory is um, starting with what is, what is version control, and I had intended for not all of this stuff to be shown on the screen, but again, this is how we roll, apparently. Um, so version control is effectively a way to uh, help you manage changes to your files. Um, it, 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 uh, it allows you to uh, go back to previous versions of a file as well as uh, kind of um, see, see changes over time. Uh, and I'm reading my notes and and we noted this needs more content, <laughs> which is perfect. Um, so we'll leave the, screw the slides for now. <laughs> um, what, do, what, does, what does version control look like to, to various, um, actually, that's a, it's a workshop, it's supposed to be interactive. What, is a, what does a version control um, look like in, in your organizations um, or in your day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, so so <laughs> said it's the um, it's the OneDrive in Office showing you the, the previous iterations of a file. Um, I know I now that I think about it, it's it's funny, it doesn't seem like it. I've been a member of Toastmasters uh, for, for a few years, uh, which is why there are absolutely no uhs and ums if anyone from to my Toastmasters group asks, I did perfect. Um, and I'm definitely, um, but one of the things that we do at, there is to, uh, we have events that need posters and being the non-technical group, they end up regularly with um, sending off an email to the group saying, Here is, here's what I suggest for the, the poster. And then um, someone else comes back and says, well, okay, but we need to make sure we add this part. So then you edit the file and you send it again, but you wanna make sure they know which one it is. And so you say, this, use this one or copy um, or final. And then you get to um, what I put on the slide there and, and um, coincidentally, the name of, of this document yes. is summit talk final copy for use this one. Because um, inevitably that's just how uh, at least non in my experience, non-technical people do version control, um, is they just do it however um, they need to do it. And, um, and so, so this leads to a problem of, well, we need to, we need to do version control. We need to, we need to be able to go back uh, on our, and look at our files from the past and, um, and see what has changed, uh, and particularly, 
if we've taken something out and then we realize we want it, whether it's for that same project or, or something else, we need to be able to um, get out and do it. And um, now, when I was growing up, uh, we used these for that. Um, they weren't zip tied together, uh, but these were the only ones I still have left. So uh, for those who aren't as old as me, uh, these are floppy, floppy disks, uh, and they hold a whopping 1.44 megabytes. Um, and you used to be able to put everything on one of those. Uh, then we moved on to CDs. Uh, and you end up with backup and mixed data. Uh, and I honestly can't tell you what is on any of these, but uh, it was it was versioned, <laughs> and there was control over it when I burned those. Uh, I'll be honest, Corey, back in my day, it was mixtape one and mixtape two. <laughs> See, but I actually had tapes. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so, and, and actually, um, to be fair, um, I, I have, and, We've all seen USB keys. That is also, uh, it turns out, a method of version control uh, that is used by some rather large uh, projects. If the one random tweet that I saw is to be believed, and it's on the internet, so therefore it is true, uh, PAL World, um, which I don't know if anyone's heard of it, I've seen it described as Pokemon with guns, uh, which again, it's on the internet, must be true. Uh, they apparently, had buckets of USB keys, and they would grab one, make their changes on the USB key, and at the end, someone just took all the USB keys and merged it all together. Um, and that was their version control, uh, <laughs> which is not, not terribly great. Um, but in, in my experience, the, uh, the process of getting uh, to version control uh, is much like uh, this image from Twitter, uh, but in kind of reverse. You start off with your project in a, in a folder, and then you need to make changes, but you want to keep the original changes, so you copy the, file, copy the folder, and then you end up with project with two Ts, and project with seven Ts, and um, so on and so forth, and then you decide, well, no, we need to give it better names, so you end up with project, project revised. Finally, you say, well, version numbers, that's what. No one can name anything, so version numbers, yes. <laughs> version numbers, My, Microsoft does it, and they do a great job. One, two, um, something, something, seven, 10. However, <laughs> how, however that joke about counting goes uh, when you're Microsoft. So. Um, and, then, and then eventually you, you come to the realization that a system like Git is what you want and, um, and so you use Git. Um, what I had actually kind of hoped was to, um, if, if I had been editing my slides this morning, which I definitely wasn't, I would have actually flipped this one upside down and just pretended that it was in the right order. Um, but again, I didn't edit them this morning, so I didn't have a chance to fix that. Um, so, now that we know why we need Git, maybe looking at how did we get to Git? How, how did we get, get to Git? Um, so then we'll have a brief, incredibly incomplete, and probably inaccurate history of version control systems. Um, and so naturally we start off with, well, back in my day, um, and I did kind of cover the floppy disks and stuff, but the, the history of version control actually goes back like pretty much to the dawn of computers. Um, in the early 60s, there were punch cards. Um, and according to this chart, because um, um, believe it or not, the 60s predates me. So I'm trusting the internet to be correct. Um, and um, it's not Twitter, so it might not be correct, but we'll hope. Um, so there was a system that came up for, for IBM uh, punch card systems, and then um, in 72, there was a new uh, source con code control system. And the one that I actually, I've actually heard of and 
been alive for at least some of um, was the revision control system is is the the earliest that I actually remember is um, or hearing about I, I don't know I might have used it as a um, in my younger days when I felt that using obscure things was a smart thing to do uh, we use re revision control system um, and then after that con concurrent versioning system is what is actually what what I cut my teeth on. We used it at college. Uh, it was a, it's a system that allows you to, you have a central server um, and you can check out the files. Uh, it, only one person can check out a file at a time. Uh, and it, it worked for a number of years. And then in about 2000, a uh, subversion was created as a successor to concurrent, or CVS, the concurrent versioning system. And uh, subversion, um, was also great, I guess, for the for its time. Uh, it it also was centralized, um, and this is where kind of in two thousand five uh, is where where we get to the the like modern, what we, I guess we would call modern version control systems such as Git, uh, and Git was created uh, by Linus Torvalds over one or two weeks, I think. Uh, um, which, which might explain a lot of Git's eccentricity. Yeah, that word. <laughs> what, might explain why Git is so convoluted and complicated to use um, and eccentric. It was created by Linus Torvalds, who is, uh, created the Linux kernel, and um, and as with a lot of things in Linux and uh, and Unix world. Uh, they like to keep things short, use obscure, uh, obscure arguments and, and whatnot. Um, and that's, and, but, but one of the big things that, that that gives us is uh, distributed version control. Because previously under subversion and, and concurrent versioning system, uh, you had a central server and um, in order to work on anything, you had to be able to talk to that central server to get your changes back um, and get distributed all of that to you to the users so that on your um, on your computer unless you tell it otherwise you have the full history um, so um, I have Wi-Fi right now but if I turned off Wi-Fi all of my git repositories I can still work in them um, and um, in in around 2005 probably a little before and a little after there were there are other systems uh, that have come out. There's Mercurial is one, um, and Mercurial is actually the only one I can think of right now. Um, there is a I can't remember the one I, I worked with um, at a company in uh, between 2008 and 2010. We worked with one uh, that it wasn't concurrent or it wasn't uh, distributed, uh, but it was a competitor to uh, Microsoft Visual Source Safe. Um, if anyone has heard that name and didn't run out of the room screaming, uh, I am shocked because uh, <laughs> the the rumor has it that even Microsoft wouldn't use Visual Source Safe, and um, because it had a had a habit of corrupting things and losing your work, um, which is not good uh, in a version control system. Um, I don't know what any of these animations are, <laughs> but um, so this that's kind of the the history of Git and why we got to Git. Um, and actually, I didn't even cover uh, that Git. Git is a what's called a directed acyclical graph, um, and so the way Git works is that uh, when you have a commit, it contains all of your your data for the change, uh, which is your your commit message and um, everything that changed on the file, and then it points to the previous change, and that one points to the previous one all the way back to the beginning, um, and you can branch off and have uh, changes that diverge. Um, but the one thing you can't do is um, either self-reference, so you can't point back to um, at your commit that you're putting in, um, or you can't have uh, 
It's acyclical, meaning that it can't, uh, it can't have cycles. It can't have circular references. Um, so you can't have A reference B reference C, which reference back to A. Um, you can have A reference B reference D, and B also reference um, C, but again, like as, uh, it doesn't let you do any of that stuff. Um, so, uh, carrying on into, um, I think this was one of the ones we had on our rough plan, um, but we called it why get, or why is the get? Yeah, why is the get, or why um, learn get effectively Yeah. in the do presentation. You, do you wanna, yeah. do you wanna cover some reasons? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, Git has become pretty much the industry standard for yeah. source control at this point. Um, it's, it's very odd that you're using Mercurial if you are, I mean, it's out there, but for the most part, Git is kind of the tool for version control. It's if you're in the DevOps space and programming at all, um, even in the open source community, that's how code is shared these days. It's pretty much through Git. Um, the other thing is information around using Git is so readily available. Um, there's tons of resources online. Uh, they have great documentation themselves, again, over all of the commands. Well, they, they, they have better documentation now. Yes. Um, there was a joke for a time where um, someone had, before the advent of ChatGPT, someone had come up with a, a system that generated a random, uh, random git command and told you what the help was. Um, and it looks surprisingly like chat GPT generated. Um, so maybe it was the precursor, but it was, um, it w the joke was when you put five or six of them together where, where like four or five of them are um, actual git commands or the help for git commands, you couldn't tell which one was, was uh, the real one or which one was the fake um, because what makes perfect sense to Linus Torvalds doesn't make perfect sense to most other most people. <laughs> exactly. So, Kind of the last thing as um, well is, it's a marketable skill. I mean, pretty much any job today, you put it on your resume, learning Git as a useful resource. Again, that allows you to work in the open source community. It allows you to work with code bases today, effectively. Yeah, and um, perhaps the most important um, is that um, Mark Rasinovich has said that Git is the bane of my development process. It's so easy to get into a state where you have to speak a magic incantation known only to the Git wizards who share their spells on Stack Overflow to get things fixed without losing changes. Um, so clearly, if you learn Git, Mark Rasinovich will think you're a wizard. Absolutely. Who is Mark? Uh, Who's Mark? Yeah, Mark who? Mark, uh, well, Mark Rasinovich. And I was the inventor of PowerShell? The what? inventor of PowerShell. No. Right? No. No? This, this is, is a conference on PowerShell. That, that's it Jeff, says Mark Rasinovich. That, that's Jeffrey and Snover. Who, who is that? That's Mark, right? Does anyone know who Mark is? <laughs> so, um, so in, in all seriousness, um, that, that actually is Jeffrey, as we all know. Uh, and Mark Rasinovich is the, uh, for those who, who don't know, which apparently, um, I thought everyone knew who it was, but I, I did learned. not before making this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, Mark is the, the CTO of Azure, uh, and he's the author of the Sys Internals uh, mm -hmm. tools, which are uh, deep. I've used those. You've used those, <laughs> and they d dive deep into the, the depths um, and the scary places of Windows. And so I figured if, if he doesn't like Git and he knows all these things about Windows, it's probably, probably a good idea to know, know Git. Um, and so um, what makes a Git, uh, I think was another one of our rough plan. Um, I totally should have actually writ written it down so I'd know uh, when we got to them. But, you know, again, I had this totally prepared and wasn't working on it just as we were starting. Um, so Git, uh, this is just some vocabulary. Uh, the Git roughly consists of a working tree, uh, staged 
stage content, sometimes referred to as an index. Uh, commits, remotes, and branches are kind of what we're gonna uh, work off of. Uh, commits are the, the uh, data uh, that make up your change sets. And then remotes are uh, actually other, get, other places that Git lives, basically. And uh, finally, branches are what, what we showed on that earlier slide of the, the various different folders with names is basically how you can think of uh, branches. And we actually have slides to actually explain a lot of them. So <laughs> I'm kind of starting with the high level there. Um, so the working, working tree, often referred to as a working directory, this is the main location of your work. This is where you're working in, uh, either at your PowerShell terminal uh, or in uh, VS Code or Visual Studio or Notepad++ or where, whatever you're working with. And it's where all of your files live and all of the code uh, lives. Um, from your working tree, uh, it'll move into stage content, which is um, as will become important later in some of the other uh, information. It's often called an index, and Git itself refers to it as an index. So if you're ever reading output uh, and it says index, uh, this is what it refers to. And this is content that you have, after you've done editing something, you, you stage it into the staging area. And the, um, basically it's the difference on based off what you've begun to work with and what differences you've put into a document. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the the, the uh, difference between it is it is the effectively the difference between the commit uh, and what you're about to commit, yes. um, and commits are um, can get complicated. Uh, they are pointers uh, to private or previous changes uh, with uh, messages and dates and such. So a commit will have uh, who committed it, what what day and time they. Uh, there's, there's actually a number of date and times on it. There's like an authored date and a committed date. Uh, and, and just the, a list of the changes um, of what's changed since the previous one that it'll point at. Um, expand how commits work. Uh, and so, so commits are, are really the, the essential building block of, of Git uh, and they make up the they basically are, when you're looking at a graphical representation of Git, mainly you're looking, looking at your commit history at that point to see what has changed at certain points that kind of make up that graph. Yeah. Um, and so uh, from commits, then we have uh, remotes, which are other uh, Git repositories. They're often not on your computer. Um, and examples of ones that uh, I'm sure most of us are, are aware of would be GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, uh, Bitbucket, and I believe I saw recently that uh, SourceForge is also uh, doing Git now um, for this the uh, software that hasn't moved off of SourceForge. So, um, and and kind of a remote is is Git's way of for being distributed because, as I mentioned there, it's a distributed version control system, uh, but by being distributed, you kind of need to know where at least one other one, one is if you're going to interact with another repository. Um, and then uh, branches are different. Uh, um, so branches are, as I said, they're like, like the folders. They're the ways that you can keep track of, of different changes. You can work on um, one project uh, or one, say you're fixing a bug uh, in your code and something comes in and you need to fix another bug, uh, higher importance one. Um, you can switch, you would then, you could create a new branch to work off of so that you're not mixing your um, your one bug with, the, I shouldn't have said bug. As, start off, you're working with a feature, creating a feature, and it's partly implemented, but a, a high priority bug comes in. Um, you're not gonna just pull that bug 
or you don't want to work on that bug in the middle of your feature because uh, you're probably not in a state where you're ready to release it. And so that's where branches will come in. Um, and they're just a collection of commits and allow you to, to keep separation like that. Yeah, absolutely. Mainly um, your branches are kind of how you release, again, like you said, certain features or certain bugs and kind of segment out that work off of a higher body of it or remote at that point. Yeah. Um, and so nat naturally a question that's gonna come up is uh, whether you use CLI or, or the GUI because there are a lot of Git GUIs um, and I, I wanna say, I wanna say there's more than one uh, CLI but it's effectively only the one um, there are other tools, but but definitely, um, in in my opinion, uh, you should start with the the CLI uh, because it allows you to um, access all of Git and many GUIs. Uh, just a, lo a lot of GUIs, at least as they start, they just run the Git command under the hood. Um, so knowing what they're doing, uh, it will help you when uh, the GUI inevitably uh, isn't able to handle the situation that it gets itself into, um, which does happen from time to time. Um, but I think uh, an important um, thing, and so um, we put a link up, up here about GUIs. Uh, there are, like the, the Git website lists a number of GUIs, um, and um, it's, it, uh, with the GUIs it's ultimately, I think a personal preference as to which one you use, if you do use one. Uh, there's also Git built into version or version control uh, operating system. Um, not GUIs in in operating systems, but in uh, like VS Code has a Git integration, uh, as does Visual Studio, and um, most most of the editors that are designed for development will have uh, Git integration, or they'll have uh, SCM integrations for source control. Modules, yes. I think is what the M is, um, and they'll, so they'll they'll have at least plugins for for these source control. Um, but it, but one thing I read um, actually just just recently is this um, saying about it's not a tool to replace another, but a tool to complement the other, and that's I think an excellent way to compare the GUI versus the CLI in this instance. Um, the GUI is not a replacement for the CLI. Um, but it does allow you to uh, augment and, and complement it. Um, and as well, on top of um, CLI and GUI, uh, there are PowerShell modules that, uh, that can help with your, your Git uh, integration. Um, one that I really like is Posh Git. Uh, it allows you to tab complete a lot of things that otherwise uh, would be quite painful to have to type out uh, or have to remember um, in the case of my branch names that end up really long and then I regret it because I have to type it out every time, uh, it solves it, I can just hit tab and it fixes it. Um, there's also one uh, called uGit that wraps around Git and uh, gives you uh, objects back um, and not just like objects based on the output from Git but objects that um, that actually, yeah, mostly mostly wrapped around, but but objects that are like fully featured, you can you can take that object and um, interact with it just like you would any other one. Um, so the big kind of difference I would say between the CLI and the GUI is with a GUI you have a back button, but that only works so often. With where the CLI you can really get into the Git interface and truly revert back your changes as well as know how to go forward with it. A lot of the GUI interfaces, at least when I started learning Git, were really helpful in that it you kind of became reliant on them a little bit um, to where with the CLI, you didn't really know what it was doing. You just knew where in an interface to click to get your work done. Where learning the CLI actually gives you the full breadth of tooling under under the hood of Git to really understand how your work is moving from creation to to pushing it up to 
you know, a higher body yeah. for approval. Yeah, and and um, and actually, one of the other things um, that we rehearsed, and I totally forgot until now. Um, one one of the other reasons that I recommend would re highly recommend uh, CLI and and learning from the CLI um, is probably the main reason we're all at uh, the PowerShell and DevOps Summit uh, is that we like to automate things. And um, I'm not sure about you, but the last time I tried to automate a GUI process, um, I wanted to do a lot worse, <laughs> or so, some not, not good things to um, the developers of the GUI that I had to try and automate. So, um, so now we've kind of covered what is Git, um, why is Git, I think. Yeah. Um, and you now an important part is uh, installation of Git. Because um, you can't use Git without actually having it installed. Fortunately, uh, it is relatively easy uh, to install. If you're on Mac OS or Linux, there is a non-zero chance uh, that you already have it installed. Um, with that, there is also a non-zero chance that it's an old version. Um, I know the last time I looked with Mac OS, even with the latest Mac OS installed, it was still uh, several years behind, um, which sometimes is, is fine. Uh, with Git, it's also probably fine, but there is, Git is actually also currently very actively developed. There are, um, one talk I saw recently was a thousand, thousand commits um, in a time period, and now I can't remember that time period. It was either a thousand commits, probably over a year now that I'm thinking more about it. Um, but there, like, so it's, no, it wasn't a year, because it was, I think it worked out to about 10, eight, Day. In any case, um, Git is still actively developed. Um, it's also actively developed by uh, people at Microsoft and uh, some very smart people uh, to figure out some of the stuff they figure out because I have tried to uh, create bare bones Git and uh, it's painful. So um, now if you happen to not be on Mac OS or uh, Linux, on Windows, it's also relatively straightforward to install. You can uh, try to install Git, or you can uh, win get install git.git. .git. Uh, you can also download it from Git SEM. Um, and then from Git SEM, or once it's installed, then you're able to start using it. Um, and um, so, so I guess uh, we'll go over what, what we kind of what I was kind of envisioning is we'll go over some some commands um, and then we'll demo uh, the commands and um, anyone working with a laptop can work to like work through the commands as we're going um, and um, and ask questions about them kind of as we go um, and kind of kind of try and build the commands upon uh, each other. So I'll start off with the git, git config. Uh, as briefly alluded to earlier, uh, it is a command used uh, for your configuring of git on your system. It's uh, the, the help text describes it as get and set repository or global options, um, which is, that's what it does, but it's, um, it does a bit more, more than that. It's, it's, the ver effectively, the, or usually, the very first command you're going to run, once you're done installing Git, uh, you're gonna need to run git config, otherwise uh, it's not gonna, it's gonna yell at you when you try to use it, uh, unless you're in Active Directory, which it might not yell at you, but it might not get the right information. Um, and so, a bare minimum configuration, uh, you'll use git config, and conveniently, the next slide, um, is is about the workshop time, but uh, so the, uh, you'll run uh, git config with the dash dash global flag, and then uh, 
the configure options are, uh, I've just read the help of this the other day that ex explained it, uh, but it's, it's period delimited and so you'll have uh, a section of the config file and then, and then the, kind of the variable in that section. So user.email is what you would uh, use to set your email address and then user.name to set your name. Um, and this uh, new one, I, I put it under as bare minimum. Uh, and I realized the notes are actually on the last slide. So, um, but this, this help.auto config or auto correct prompt is one that um, I actually just learned um, maybe about a month ago. Um, and I would highly recommend uh, that everyone sets it to prompt um, or, or a different value. Um, I'm gonna back it, oh, if I push the right button, I'm gonna back it up. Because uh, uh, to read my notes about uh, help.autocorrect. Um, so if get detects typos when you're typing an error, um, I'm sure we've all run, the, run into it where we run a command at PowerShell and we typed the command wrong. And then PowerShell yells at us and says, hey, that's the wrong, I don't know what that command is. Um, git tries to be helpful to you and it'll say, hey, you, you typed in omit, but there's no command called omit. Did you mean commit? Um, and I, I grumbled all the time about this. It's why are you suggesting it to me when you know what the command is? Just run the command. It turns out there's a setting for that. Um, the default is to, to just show you the suggested command, say, hey, you, you typed it wrong, I think it was this one, and leave it at that. You can also set a value of a positive number, which is to run the command, suggested command after specified deciseconds, um, and this comes into the eccentricities of Git, uh, is that it uses deciseconds, which are tenths of a second instead of, I don't know, seconds, and then just allowing a decimal place. But, um, so if you were to set it to 10, it would wait one second. Um, immediate, it'll just run the suggested command. Um, prompt is, will, it'll prompt you and then you can just say yes or no. And never is, it'll just say, hey, that was the wrong command and leave it at that. Um, I, would, I would kind of argue that never would have been a better default so I wouldn't grumble about it, but um, apparently maybe actually having the, the suggestion and me grumbling enough about it told the YouTube algorithm to show me some video where someone talked about it. Um, but they're definitely not listening to us, so that can't be it. Um, so we got the, that's the kind of the bare minimum uh, configurations. Um, and this is where we have a slide uh, where it says uh, workshop time and um, where I'm gonna work through uh, the, the parts that we've, the, the few parts that we've covered um, so far, which is on this Windows 11 VM, I hope, um, that it was working. Um, oh, come on. kind of actually need that VM. <laughs> ah, it wouldn't be a demo without, without things going wrong, would it? Okay. Um, you know what? We'll just reset the VM and hope that hope that I changed the the settings before. Good, I did. Um, so this is a a relatively bare bones Windows 11 uh, VM that I hope will start up 
because otherwise, um, otherwise I have to demo with the live live system, which gets a little tricky. Oh. Thank you, Windows. Tomorrow's Patch Tuesday, right? No? T tomorrow, okay. Because I patched it like a week ago. <laughs> like, like I might have, I might have joked that I was going to patch it um, just before, but I would certainly not actually. <laughs> I would only edit my presentation right before. I <laughs> There's levels to the insanity. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I have a snapshot. Okay. Okay, maybe it'll be okay. <laughs> I mean, at least it at least it knows that it has four processors now. Um, up until up until very recently, um, I told it it had four, but Windows only picks up two uh, because of sockets and licensing, apparently. Um, but so now, if I open a terminal as an administrator. And I'm going to turn, hopefully, turn sounds off on that. Um, so uh, we said to install uh, git, it is win git install uh, git dot git. And I think I am on, I am apparently on Wi Fi, so it will. Uh, as it, um, it will apparently download and install it, or download and install something. Um, and as, as mentioned, this is relatively bare bones, uh, and I'm realizing that might be a little hard to see, but um, if you trust me, it's just win get installing uh, get, or git. Um, make it bigger, I think. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, easy enough to just install um, and wait for to download because I don't know if we can actually, if you can actually pre um, like pre cache that sort of thing with uh, with GitHub. I know I had a fallback if the internet wasn't there, um, and that was a chocolatey package, but. We felt like for um, for this to lean into the whole um, we're not we're not representing chocolatey we're not um, we would use not chocolatey to install things um, uh, and what I do remember from uh, from at least the last time I tested this is uh, so once it's installed I have to close. Uh, that terminal and launch a new terminal. Uh, this one won't be as an administrator because uh, as we all know, you shouldn't run as an administrator regularly. Uh, but now we have the git command and we can just run git and get a bunch of output um, to the screen. Uh, and so we had hoped to have two laptops so I could read off of uh, the slide, but uh, yes. That's not. We're looking to do git config. Yeah, so so we did uh, git config dash dash global uh, user dot email um, and typing actually. So so I mentioned like this is the the bare minimums of of git uh, the or what I consider the bare minimums, um, but. Let's leave that up for now. Help dot autocorrect, um, and then we'll set that to prompt. Um, and to give you an idea of the of the how the help uh, 
help works is, or help how that one works and just to demo it instead of just saying, hey, that's how it works. Uh, if I were to just type uh, git config, but I missed the C uh, and then global, um, I'm gonna use user.name for right now. We're gonna say my name is Corey because that is what I tell everyone my name is. Um, and so this is the, the prompting is that um, you called it on fig, which doesn't exist, uh, run config instead, and I can just hit Y uh, for yes. And now if I do a git, or a git config dash dash list, um, it will, it lists out the configurations and I can see that my uh, user.name is, is Corey. And I'm trying to, if I do, if I forget that I'm not at my computer and I do a git f, um, the, the one thing that this won't do is when you're in, um, if there's more than one command, it won't, it won't prompt you to run it. It'll just say, here's the, here's the however many commands. Um, and then you have to figure out which one you meant based on that, uh, which is probably a good thing. It's also actually the reason that I prefer prompt instead of uh, just running it is because I'm, I'm fearful that I'm gonna type something and Git's gonna say that's not a command and it's gonna pick something different and do something I don't want it to do. Um, but I also can't think of any command where it would, where it would actually um, do damage, so. Um, so this is the, that's the, like, getting started, getting Git installed now. Um, from it being installed, uh, we can now go and use it. One of the things, um, then you might have noticed that I purposely left off so far was I didn't, hadn't set the email. Um, and the reason I hadn't set the email, I'm realizing now is I wanted to demo, um, but I'm not going to, I think for a bit, is um, so I, the reason that I, suggest, I would suggest setting your, your name and email in your Git configuration um, and definitely setting it to with global uh, is because if it's not set, uh, especially on Windows, it will, Git will try to be helpful. It'll try to figure out what, you, what your name um, and your email address is. Now, uh, if you're in an Active Directory environment, uh, it might be able to, I think it, it, it I don't know if it queries um, the Active Directory or, or if that information is just on your user account, um, but I've had it at least figure out parts of it. It seems to look at logon domain and username to figure out your email. So um, in the case of a um, of former employer, I was CNOX um, and the domain was their, their domain. Um, and so it would pick that up, which my email address was actually uh, Corey underscore Knox. Uh, and so, so this is kind of why, one of the reasons I also suggest doing it is that uh, you're, you're able to be very specific about what email it uses. Uh, the git config command also has, so this was using dash dash global, you can also use dash dash local. Uh, so when you're, in, when you're in a git repository, you can do uh, git config dash dash local and it will set the configuration inside of that. Uh, inside of that body of work, basically. Yeah, inside, inside of that repo so that um, maybe you have Maybe you have Git repositories that you're gonna use for work and you want to use your work email and then you do open source work um, on the side and you want to use your personal email for that. Um, you're able to do, for each repository, have a setting. Um, and I think this is the part where technically we would go back to the, um, Back to the slides. Um, and the next slide was asking if there's any questions. 
Um, so I'll ask if anyone has any questions. Missy? Um, so for help.autocorrect, uh, the default is zero. Uh, it can be any, uh, if I turn this back on, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't on the screen. So I just, I have my notes um, here. So it can be uh, zero, which is the default. So just show the command. It can be a positive number. Um, but I think when they say positive number, they actually mean positive integer, so no decimal point. Um, and it, it, that's the one um, decisecond, so one tenth of a second uh, for how long to wait before it automatically runs it. Uh, it can be immediate, which will run it uh, immediately. You can prompt, uh, which is, as I said, the, the one I suggest, and never, will just never prompt. Um, Hey, Corey, a good example of that would be, how can we show the help of that command actually inside of Git? That's an excellent, we, and we can do that, maybe, if this all works. Um, okay, uh, so if we did, so uh, Git, actually all Git commands um, have a dash dash help uh, argument. And so you can run dash dash help. Um, one of my complaints, uh, in my, my personal opinion is that if you're on a, if you're a, if you're a command line interface and someone asks you for help, you should give help in the command line interface. Um, this is just kind of my opinion though, uh, apparently Git does not share my opinion because uh, it goes uh, to an online resource. I, well, it doesn't mm -hmm. even go to online resource. It, in, it ships with HTML resources and it takes you to the HTML. Uh, at least on Windows it does. Um, I believe on Linux it might not. Um, and it definitely wouldn't if it knows you're on SSH, if you're SSH in. Um, but that being said, uh, a benefit of, of the web browser is you can, uh, if you figure out where the keys are on the keyboard you don't normally use, you can search. Uh, so we can actually, what was it called? Autocorrect. Autocorrect? So we can search for the help.autocorrect um, and it can, so we can get to the, the help for it, or yeah, the help for it. Um, in the case of the, the uh, uh, git config command, uh, which is what it's showing here, um, it shows kind of all the, the other ones that it knows of. Uh, I believe you can also, you're actually able to, to set things that it doesn't know are, are config things, and I think some tools take advantage of that. So they'll pull, they can pull data out of the configuration. Um, I could also just be making that up, so don't. <laughs> um, you could try it and see if it works. Um, and if it works, great. Uh, actually, one might argue it's not great because if I do a git config, uh, elp dot auto, and I say Bob, and I actually type it dash dash global. So I can do a git uh, config uh, dash dash list. So this, so, so yeah, it will take any command or any, any property and add it to your config file, um, which is helpful, but also uh, not as helpful. Um, and so um, from there, if there's no other questions about the installing and kind of just getting started with Git, um, we'll move on to uh, once you've got it, once you've got Git installed, well, your next step is you're probably gonna want to get your repository started. Um, and uh, your repository, to, to get your repository started, you're gonna want the git init command. Um, 
which according to help creates an empty git direct or git repository or reinitializes an existing one. Um, I think I have used it to reinitialize an existing one maybe five times if I'm being generous. Um, I would get in it is probably more often than not you're just going to be uh, initializing an empty repository uh, and not only not only that, this is probably like one of the commands you're going to use least often, but is important to know um, because, or actually maybe it won't be using it um, the least often. Uh, if you're setting up, uh, or if you're initializing new Git repositories, um, for myself, most of the time I'm not initializing, I'm pulling uh, from GitHub or GitLab um, repositories that already exist. But, um, this one. These are for those rare for, instances where you actually write your own code and don't just find it on the internet. I write my own code. <laughs> sometimes. And sometimes not. Um, and then I put that, I, I think I had the intention, that, or I, I had the thought that this was gonna be easier because we were gonna be switching between laptops. But this is also still just as easy. Um, so to, to do that, to, to use get in it, uh, you click in uh, so that it, to, um, you just take type get in it and you give it the name of uh, what you want your repository to be called. Um, I don't know, uh, let's call it summit demo. Um, I'm realizing I've never tested with, if it works with spaces, but if you put spaces in your um, in your file paths, uh, you... You're monsters for one. I was gonna say you're a bad person and you should feel bad, but... Yes. Apparently you're monsters. Do not use spaces. Windows um, and spaces. No. Sorry? Windows and spaces. Then there's quoting. Quoting. Yeah. No. And let's not, let's not talk about program files, though. Um, at least we don't have documents and settings anymore. Um, so now we have, uh, I don't know what I was going to show with, with git init command. Like it's, you run git init and then it's there. And we haven't talked about the other commands that I could run to show you. <laughs> um, I'll do. I was uh, going to say, if you, uh, do an output of it. There's nothing in here. Yes. If I do, if I do a, a uh, get child item, there's nothing. Uh, except that if I force it, then, so we get a, we get a git directory that's hidden, or dot git. Um, the dot is actually important, uh, because that's actually where git looks, and everything that's not Windows treats dot uh, as hidden files, so. Um, So we've initialized it, that, that initializes a git directory or a git repository and that git repository, there is stuff in that dot git directory uh, that you're not. Essentially not gonna, it's just keeping you, track yeah. of the changes. Yeah, and like like being initialized, like there's, there's stuff in there but there's not really any, there's nothing, no data in there yet. Um, and so we, that's where we want to uh, talk about working with, working with your repository. I'm seeing things on the screen that seem. Never mind. I just have dust on my screen. <laughs> so, um, so the next command uh, is git checkout, um, and this is you. So. So remember back at the beginning, um, I mentioned that this, we're just gonna talk about one way of doing Git and there's lots of ways of doing Git. Um, the checkout command is kind of one of those things. Uh, the checkout command, uh, I believe dates back to like 2005, it was one of the first commands because uh, they use checkout in all the other version control systems. Um, and they use it to mean switch branches or restore working tree files, um, which, which means that you can run, checkout doesn't, 
doesn't tell you necessarily what, or um, it doesn't do one thing, it does a whole bunch of things. And the thing, um, and part, part of the reason kind of I'm you know, showing that one is, um, I've been, as I said, I've been using Git for, for years since before uh, they now have a switch command and a restore command, uh, which do switch, switches the branches and restore, restores the working tree. Um, and um, although you can use those, I haven't, I, I have muscle memory of typing checkouts. So um, that's why we're covering the checkout is used to, to check out your uh, working, or sorry, not your working tree, check out your branches and move and restore files uh, in your working tree. Except I'm not 100% sure on how the restoring ones work. You, <laughs> because I cover restore later. So, um, so once you've, I know why I had it. So the first thing we're gonna wanna, you, you wanna do is check out. And so you use checkout to create a branch or to create a branch um, so that you can work in your repository. Um, and then once you've checked out a branch, Down means go forward. I'm gonna forget that again, but <laughs> um, once you've checked out your, your uh, branch that you wanna be working on, uh, you want to get status is the next command that you'll likely be using, which is the show to, sh or the, the help says it shows the working tree status, which is exactly what it does. It shows you, it tells you what uh, in your working tree has changed what files might be new or uh, deleted or changed. And then once, once you know what's uh, new or deleted or changed is where uh, you would want to use git add um, to add them, add the file into, your, into the index. Um, and this was why I mentioned earlier that index is what git calls the staging directory or the staging area and stage content uh, is because taken direct from the help file, uh, add file con add, adds file contents to the index, which is your stage I would, area. I would argue the help would have been better to actually say staged, staging area or something like that, but um, I'm, not, I'm not a Git um, contributor, so I, yeah. Um, now, I'm realizing how bad these, sli these slides are. Uh, but so, so once once we've like we're wor when we're working in a directory, we want to track changes uh, to the working directory um, and kind of know where we're at. And we can run the, the git status command, uh, which will say which will tell you what's changed. Um, and I am going to demo it uh, shortly. Uh, but but. Seeing what's changed isn't, um, if you have to run git, git status every single time, it can be quite overwhelming. It can also give you an awful lot of output for, uh, that you may not actually be interested in. And that's where posh git, uh, or that's another place where posh git uh, can come in because posh git by default, if you haven't configured your, uh, your prompt, uh, it will give you the status in your prompt. Um, so it'll tell you what branch you're on as well as uh, what your, what your get status of your repository is. Um, and then from there, we have git commit, uh, which records changes uh, to your repository. So these are the ones that we have added uh, to the repository. And once you've added them to the repository, you want to commit them. Um, and you would use the git commit command, um, which takes us up to demoing these commands that I am absolutely not going to forget where we were. Um, so we did a net, and we said we check out. Yep. So let's do that. 
smile for everything. Um, <laughs> I don't suppose anyone in here uses VMware Workstation, do they? And can give suggestions as to why this keeps happening. Uh, control Shift Escape. That's not the task manager I want. Send Control Delete. Okay. Uh, not full sleep settings. Is that what I heard someone say? You're probably right. I think the. Let's go into the good interface. It is turning this. I bet you it's. Yeah. Turn the display off and, um, and you know what? Let's make it high performance because uh, we are high performance people. It also started at a much higher resolution, um, which might be why, or might be why it doesn't come back. That's right. So, um, so you're gonna do a Git checkout to create our. Thank branch. you. So. Uh, so Git Checkout, so the great thing about Git Checkout, um, as I mentioned, is it does a lot of things. And uh, one of them, and the way that I always do it, is to create a branch, uh, you have to, if you're creating a new branch that doesn't exist, you have to give it the dash B command, uh, which stands for branch, I think. Yes. Um, the switch command uses dash C, which means create, uh, and if you're if you were to go off of like use the command for what it's supposed to, you would technically use branch, um, which again is very helpful to. Um, but the, the the trouble with using like something like git branch to create the branch, and then then you have to git switch to just switch over to it or git checkout. Um, I always just do git checkout uh, dash b and my Super cool, not at all, ridiculously long branch name. So I have now checked out my new branch, uh, and I'm over here, and I can see that by running git status, and it tells me that I'm on uh, branch, uh, my super cool, not at all, ridiculously long branch name. Um, and I can continue uh, with working on things. But what if I wanted to go back to the previous branch that I don't even know the name of now? Um, the great thing about Git Checkout and technically switch is that this is either gonna work because I'm remembering it correctly or it's not. Um, if it doesn't work, we'll scrub it from the recording. I'm sure, definitely. Um, but if you run git checkout with just a hyphen, it will actually take you back. No. Nope. Okay. I might not have been on any branches. Uh, pretend you, wait. Um, I think, I think it's because I don't have, um, we haven't covered git log yet, but we're gonna cover it soon. And I think it's because we don't have any commits, so therefore there's no, br br branches don't have anything that they're pointing at. Um, which means that um, it's not helpful. So what was the next command after, 
Was it, it was ad, wasn't it? Was it was ad. Okay, so. At this point we have to make something. With your so name. we're gonna create a new file. Um, I don't know, I'm really amazing at naming things. And we're gonna do notepad script because this is a bare bones VM so we don't have much on it. Uh, and write host, write host considered awesome. And we'll just close that, tell it to save. And now if I do a git status, uh, apparently with two S's because we want to demo the uh, autocorrect again, uh, and definitely not because I typoed, uh, and we choose yes. So now we see that we're on our super cool branch uh, and we have uh, our single script uh, PS1. Um, apologies for the, the colors I'm realizing. Um, blame Windows, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, but so, so it says like nothing's been added to commit, but it shows us that our script.ps1 is, is what it calls an untracked file. And we can add it with git add file uh, and it'll be included. Um, and so effectively at that point, we'll put it in the stage or index. In, in the index, yeah. So we'll add that um, with our script. Um, and now if we do a git status, um, we see our new file and we see that um, now it's changed from red to green uh, and tells us that it is a new file. Um, and uh, this is kind of a demos the running git status all the time to get the same uh, or this output is uh, cumbersome at best. Uh, so we're gonna install module posh git. Um, okay, uh, and we're gonna scope it to current user because again, bare bones VM forgot about some of these things and I don't, apparently don't have, uh, have an updated PowerShell get. I'm looking at the time. We have a few minutes before. Oh wait, no. Um, in about six minutes is when you're going to be talking, yes. and I'm going to go get food. Okay. Um, so now we import Poshkit, and so now this is the the default um, the default prompt when you don't have a prompt. Uh, and so it tells you uh, various things like what branch you're on, as well as uh, it being, gr being green here means that it is uh, the stage stuff. If I do uh, git reset, which we'll cover. Um, don't, don't push the power button that's right above the delete button. Because apparently, apparently it's really easy to just push the button and it, I really hope it just went to sleep. <laughs> um, don't look. Okay. Um, I think it's with that. Yes. Okay. So, so when it's red, um, it means that there are okay let's see Windows P do it's back it, again, okay you didn't bring the goats did you no not enough of them um, so when it's red it means that there's have been, ch there's changes uh, to the local directory. Uh, we'll see it a different color uh, than green shortly too. Um, let's do a new, oh. Okay, type. 
I'm just going to copy script uh, to be script two because reasons. Um, and so if we do git add uh, script one or two, apparently there's no script one. Oh. Uh, so we, so um, when we have multiple, like it, the default, it shows like this. Uh, it's also not terribly great at the moment because uh, some moron picked a really long, uh, ridiculously long branch name, you might say. Uh, but I digress, we'll carry on. Uh, once we've added it to the, the, the index, uh, we wanna commit it. And so we run git commit uh, and you, if you run, if you just run git commit, it's going to open the default editor. Um, actually, no, it won't in this case. Uh, in the case of this, is that th this is why I men mentioned uh, you set the user and the email. Is that um, if it doesn't know what your user, like your email is, uh, it tries to figure it out. And in the case of it tried to e figure out my email address and it decided that my email address is corbob at uh, corbob dash win, actually, yeah, win 11 dot uh, none because it's, I'm not on a domain, I'm not on a network that is giving me a, uh, a CDN. Sorry? Um, on DHCP, it can, the, the DNS lookup address, um, it doesn't, it's not giving me that, so it can't figure, it can't, it can't make a guess as to what, what it thinks my email address should be, um, so it yells at me. And uh, in this case, I think it, if it detects that either one of them it can't figure out, it just tells you about both of them. Uh, but we're just gonna, we're gonna take their example of an email, uh, and you will want to actually do this. Don't, don't do what I'm doing here, but because you're not you at example.com. Um, neither am I, but I'm demoing, so I get to do what I want. So now when we commit, it opens the default editor, uh, which is the best editor, uh, which is uh, Vim, and we're gonna tell it that we're in dark mode so that things are kind of visible. Uh, and then we have to give it a commit message, and a commit message uh, must, absolutely must, this is the rules of commit messages. And if you get nothing from this, no, it starts with open parentheses, the hashtag, the number of the GitHub issue that you're working on, close parentheses, space, the title of your commit message is my commit message that goes no more than 50? Josh, is it 50? It's 50. Goes no more than 50 characters long, and it shows you down at the bottom here that we're at 33, and then there's a blank line, and then I did some really cool things. All of these can go no longer than 72. This is the way you have to do it. Git will break if you do it any other way, or you just, or whatever you want. I mean, uh, you just say, hey, um, and then it's committed. Um, and because it's Vim, everyone knows how to quit Vim, so I don't need to tell you that it's colon WQ. Um, but it would be actually probably is good to mention, I don't know how many people here actually use Vim um, or, or know how to quit or anything like that. There is a git config uh, for the editor. Um, and so I'm gonna pull that up just um, before we break for, there's snacks out there, right? Okay. Um, I'm gonna find, no, editor. Core.editor is the name that you want to set. So, so um, 
what we'll carry on with after we come back from the coffee break is actually setting that so that um, so that you don't have to. Uh, I was able to quit Vim. Uh, some people might have to shut down their computer to quit Vim. So uh, we'll help you not have to shut down your computer after the break. So we're definitely going to go off script because um, we definitely had fully prepared everything and haven't been winging any of this. Um, <laughs> so uh, to carry on from where we kind of what, it was half an hour ago and I can't remember what we were doing. <laughs> um, so I've worked that's with a local. interesting to me. Sorry. We worked with creating a local Git. We, we have, we've created a local Git, Git directory um, we've uh, set up our email address. We've committed uh, a question that came up um, during the break uh, was about the, uh, uh, let me, let me add the, the file. Um, so one trick you can do with git add uh, is if you give it a dot um, for your local directory, um, that's going to work perfect because I'm definitely not going to kick that. <laughs> Which is true because I haven't moved over that way at all. Um, but you can use a dot to, like, to add the entirety of the local directory. Um, that can sometimes be dangerous because um, so, it will add all tracked and untracked files, which we haven't really covered any, um, any tracked files yet that have changed because we've barely gotten them in. Uh, but the question that came up was regarding git commit uh, and uh, again set bg equals dark. Um, and so I had made um, the, the tongue in cheek comments about uh, that the message absolutely has to start with parentheses, uh, a hashtag in it, or Octothorpe or whatever, the hash symbol. And um, a number and then close parentheses and and um, why that is and um, and also a bit about why it's tongue it was it's tongue in cheek. Uh, the commit messages can be absolutely anything you want. Um, if if you've ever worked with uh, GitHub Actions or any other CI/CD system or seen uh, the commits generated from people working with them. A lot of them will just be, and I know for myself, it definitely are, uh, just something, uh, or maybe this needs to be true, or let's try this again. Uh, and then when it's done, uh, you do some magic that hopefully we're gonna um, cover as I put my timer on again, um, and definitely do it four minutes in instead of 10. It's a, Getting better. By the end of the week, it'll. I don't have anything else after today. So, um, but uh, I derailed my train of thought um, myself. Um, okay, yeah. So, so the if you're using CI/CD, or or if you've if you've seen the commits generated by someone trying to get CI/CD to work. There is an awful lot of uh, trying this something uh, and like just asinine commit messages that don't mean anything. And then when they get to the end, um, they'll do what's called a rebase um, and just get rid of everything and just say, oh, first try, because uh, clearly it was only the first try. That's what the Git history says. Um, so the commit messages don't need to don't need to be uh, these in these specific ways. Um, they, but we use that. That's what we use at Chocolatey. Uh, is the uh, you start with the identifier of the issue that you're working on. So it, that's the open parentheses hashtag and the number. Uh, and one of the things that that gives you is in GitHub or GitLab, and I suspect the other Git uh, hosting providers. Um, is it links it up to that issue. So oftentimes when you're looking at it in a web interface, you'll see 
um, you'll see it and you'll be able to click, um, click on it and take you to that issue. Um, but the 50 characters and the 72 is also um, important in that it comes from the, comes from the, the time when, uh, when terminals were only 80 characters wide uh, because that's when Linux comes from and there's a lot of stuff that, that goes back to 80 characters even though we all have wide screens now. Uh, but even though we all have wide screens, we uh, oftentimes our Git, when we're working with Git, uh, if you're working with it in, in your editor and looking at your commit messages or um, anything else, it won't be the full screen, it'll just be like a toolbar on the side. And so the 52 characters, or sorry, the 50 characters of the, of the very first line, which is the title, uh, which is or often displayed as the title, um, allows for additional information that often comes with that title. So there'll be the commit hash, uh, which is Git's uh, reference to that commit, uh, which will usually be about six characters in, in length, uh, as well as your uh, possibly the date or who committed it. Um, so that gives you room to expand without cutting off. And then the 72 is, um, again, on, on some things that are narrow, it allows without word wrap because uh, one of the things as well is that when you're committing, you have control over that word wrapping. Um, you have control over when, when line breaks happen, whereas if you just type it all in one big, big long line and then you commit it and someone opens it up in their terminal and they try to read it and it gets halfway through a word and then it decides to, to line wrap, that's not a good experience. So, um, so yeah, the, the commit message can be absolutely anything you want. Um, and before I actually commit this one, um, I'm gonna quit this and uh, do what we said we were gonna do at the beginning. So I can do git config dash dash global uh, and type properly. Uh, and then I think it was core.editor. And I'm gonna say notepad.exe. So now when I just run the git commit command, uh, it opens in editor and apparently, I don't know how that new notepad feature will work with this message, um, but I also don't normally use Windows 11. So uh, be aware of that if you're gonna use notepad as your editor apparently, because I think something happens where it, it'll load like it tries to remember it for you. Um, I can say just this is our commit. Um, and one of the things uh, about it, the, the default commit message, it does load up um, like this, what we have on the screen, which shows you, like it, it gives you all the comments and kind of describes for you. Um, so I, which kind of why I, I glossed over it um, earlier as well, it gives you kind of the information about the changes that you're about to commit. Um, so you also have like another chance to look back and say, oh, well, actually, I don't want to do that. And then once the file is uh, saved and the editor is closed is when it finally, um, when it commits. If you don't want to actually commit anything, you just close it. Um, otherwise, it'll commit them. Um, and now, is Git log the next one yes. that we had on our list? I think, yeah, actually, we what kind of planned that we were gonna talk about Git log after the break, but didn't actually, thought we were gonna get beyond Git log before the break. Um, so now we've come back from our break and it gives us the perfect opportunity to actually say, well, what, what have we done uh, recently? And by default, git log gives us um, this, this is the output uh, that it gives us. It tells us uh, the information about our commit. Uh, head is, I'm realizing we did, hadn't discovered head and it is actually a very important concept in git. Um, and head is what, how git refers to uh, where git happens to currently be. Um, and um, a, a way to just, that is uh, just let me 
install Git Kraken. I don't know if Git Kraken is on uh, is on WinGet, so I'm using Chocolatey here. But so while that's installing, um, head is uh, Git's pointer to where you currently are in your repository. And so in this case, head is pointing to uh, my super cool, not at all ridiculously long branch name. Uh, and uh, it's in particular pointing at the, the first commit in here. Uh, and this other commit is the one that came before it. And log just kind of gives us the details of that. Um, You don't have the latest slide. Oh. <laughs> Version control. I, I know you don't have the latest slide because there is no help on that screen. <laughs> okay, coffee break. Wait, yeah, okay. That is where we would want it to be. But I... We did git add git, so I think, because we totally practiced it and are professionals, we were supposed to come back to slides and not necessarily the demo part. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were at coffee break. I thought I was much further behind than we were, but apparently not. Um, but you'd see the difference, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the joys of, of version control and working with mul multiple people, obviously, is the, uh, I have one copy and he has a different one, <laughs> um, which hopefully we'll get into uh, shortly. So I thought I hadn't talked about log. <laughs> so git log um, shows your commit logs and it shows you how to It shows you the information about it. Uh, it shows you the, the commit um, and the head. And this is actually perfect because Git Kraken will be ready by the time we get to it anyways. Uh, and along with Git, Git log. So Git log gives you kind of your commit details of the commit message that you gave it, who committed it, uh, and that's generally it. But Git show uh, shows you various types of objects is what the help does. Uh, in most cases, you're just going to be asking it for um, for commits uh, or um, or branches, uh, or maybe not. Maybe you'll do more than that. I guess I shouldn't I shouldn't make assumptions about how you're going to use Git, uh, especially since my way of using Git is constantly changing. Um, but it shows you it shows you more details about it. In particular, it shows you t or it. it I, I use it to show the uh, the change set and show the the diff of of what that file or what that change actually did. Um, and then after show we have git reset, which um, resets current head to the specified state. Um, and this this might have been where I actually intended to talk about head because um, I remember having seen it and uh, made a note in my in my head that I needed to make sure I talk about head uh, because uh, Git, I think head comes from like the version control systems that came before Git. So that's how they used it and that's um, therefore that's why they still call it head. Um, another way you could think of is just the pointer of pointing at where uh, we currently are. Um, and then uh, from, and reset, Reset is another one, one of those commands like checkout. Uh, it can do a lot of like various things. Uh, one thing that you'll often see is running uh, git, re git reset dash dash hard to uh, wipe out all your changes on um, in the working directory. I would lean towards using git restore, uh, which restores your working tree files. In particular, you can give it uh, just individual files and it will restore um, just those. Uh, and that's, so 
you've made changes to the file and you decide you're not gonna keep those changes for whatever reason. Um, a common one for myself is in some of our debugging, we have to set, um, set certain things um, in, in the programs to be certain ways and uh, those don't work in when, once it's out in production. So you make the, that change, you do your debugging and then you can just get restored to get rid of it. Um, uh, git stash is uh, um, to allow you to, to stash the changes uh, in a dirty working directory away as the co <laughs> copy and paste off the help uh, says. Um, and a dirty working directory is just one that has changed and you've made edits to. Um, okay, I was questioning whether I just had a whole list and didn't actually have planned stops, but that's a lie. Um, and Git Clean, uh, before we go into more demos, uh, Git Clean is um, probably one of my, my actually most used uh, commands and it removes untracked files uh, from the working tree. Uh, and because all the other commands that so far have worked mostly like with um, with tracked files. So if you get restore or get reset, uh, you can only restore or reset these the ones that files that you're tracking. Whereas get clean uh, will get rid of effectively get rid of the untracked files, um, which um, we'll cover how to untrack, hopefully we'll cover how to untrack later, or how to, not untrack, ignore files later. Um, so I think you have the right order there, Ryan. It's the, yep. <laughs> it, it's the. Um, have the Cliff Notes version. The Cliff, well, so, <laughs> so we covered log, um, and, and our, actually the intention was to come back from, from break and to, to cover log because uh, as we've uh, demoed, I can't remember what I did half an hour ago, how can I remember what I did a week ago? Therefore, uh, log is allow, allows you to see uh, what you've seen. Log uh, and a uh, number of, well, so we get log. Uh, the other one is get show um, and show in this case, we don't have many commits again. Uh, wait. Why is, oh, so git log uh, will show you a log um, of multiple things um, and you can, you can be more specific uh, and so we can give it uh, the commit hash, uh, which is this one here. We can either copy the whole thing uh, or you can get away with usually about six characters, I think, is the, is it six or eight? I think it's six. Or sometimes one, sometimes the other. Um, basically, Git will allow you to, anytime you're working with these things, you can give it a commit. Uh, you can either give it the full commit or you can give it, uh, Similar to PowerShell parameters, um, you can give it just enough to uniquely identify it. Um, so like if you're doing, in PowerShell you do select select object, you can do dash expand instead of dash expand property. As long as you get far enough to identify it uh, uniquely, it'll uh, figure the rest out. Um, which means that I can do it with even five, which is fewer than the six. Um, but so, so git log, you can, you can either just run git log and it shows all of them. You can give it a, a single commit. Um, uh, you can also do git log uh, hyphen and then give it any number and it will give you just that number of commits. So if I give it one, it'll only show me the last one commit. Um, this might be a good opportunity to see if we have any other branches, which I bet you we don't. Um, but now if I do a git checkout, 
dash b. I was gonna, I was gonna put in a swear, but I suspect we shouldn't. Uh, check out dash b. Hello, because I am very unique with my uh, with my uh, branch names. Um, but to, to demo what we tried to demo earlier, uh, now if I do a git checkout and do dash, yes, I knew I wasn't losing my mind. So when you have branches, you can switch um, back to the one you just came from with git checkout dash uh, or git switch dash. Uh, we'll both take you back to that previous one. Um, and the, uh, which, is, which is helpful in cases like this because uh, I really don't want to type out my super cool, not at all, ridiculously long branch name. Um, but uh, in the case of that one, uh, to demo the, the posh git, and one of the reasons I love posh git is that I can do git checkout um, and I hit M and then hit tab and it just figures out my commit or my, my branch name for me and I didn't have to type it out, especially since I would probably type it uh, spelling super correctly because um, I definitely would not have typoed that earlier either, um, except that I was demonstrating. So that's, that's the only reason typos happen, right? Um, okay. So, so I'm gonna switch back to this shorter one uh, and, um, and actually demo some things about reset, because reset's the next command. Um, or at least, yes. I, yeah, that's what it says down there. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, reset, oh, I know what I wanted to show because it's going to lean into, uh, so new item, bad, oh no, it was, it was good compression file, wasn't it? Um, if anyone's following the XZ debacle, but, um, Bad file, PS1. Um, so, so with the git reset command, um, as I said, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, one of the, uh, or the the one that I do most most often is uh, if I add. So I've added my my bad file into my index, um, and I decide that actually I don't want to commit this this file. Um, the way to get it out um, is to run. Uh, git reset uh, bad file, and that will reset it, or it'll take it out of the index, but it'll leave it in the working directory. Um, and I think even, I've never tried this with an untracked file, so we'll see if it works. Okay, apparently I, I, never, I didn't remember that I can't do it with pass. Um, so if I do a git reset hard, that's where, um, so git reset hard will take, um, clear out your working directory, um, of any changes, uh, whether actually, whether they are in your index or not, um, which is handy for when you're working with remotes. Um, I use git reset hard, um, all the time on the remote side. Uh, because it allows me to uh, keep my local branch in line with uh, the upstream. Uh, in the case of, it's usually chocolatey software. Um, like for, for the Choco command, um, it's much easier, or I find it in the easiest way to get that uh, in sync. Um, and the git, so the restore command, is used to restore the files. Um, whereas 
Git reset also restores the files, which is, this is the fun part about Git, is that, as I said, there's multiple ways um, to do it, uh, but with the, in my experience, it's, I, I find it easiest to use restore to restore files uh, from uh, when they're changed, which means I actually have to change a file. So, uh, is considered harmful uh, because that is actually, oh. So don't forget to save, apparently, if you have this new, this new tabbed uh, notepad, otherwise it'll just keep it and not actually prompt you to save. Um, but now, we have a changed file, um, and so we can run git restore, uh, and then we have to specify the, the files that we want to restore. Um, but before we do that, let's look at git status. And we haven't covered git diff. Did we say we're gonna cover diff? No, not yet. Not yet, but did I do the dumb and do we actually have 25 that we need to cover? Okay, um, so a 25th command to cover is git diff, uh, which is actually, I think, quite important because uh, you often want to see what, what you've changed. And uh, uh, especially when you're picking what you want to, to commit. So git diff, we're gonna pretend that we have a slide, uh, and git diff means show changes between commits uh, commit and working tree. Uh, so perfectly simple. Uh, in practice, um, so you would run git diff, because uh, I made changes to script.ps1, uh, but I don't know if I want to commit them. And uh, status just tells me that it's changed, but it doesn't tell me what's changed. Uh, so I run, so diff actually tells me that uh, we, uh, in this case, it's, it's not always the best output um, because it just it says, well, you deleted this line and you added this line, when in fact, a, a rich diff uh, would show us that actually we just changed the word awesome to the word harmful, I think. Yes. But it also might have, no, it would have told us if it was line if it was in coding change, I think. Um, and so what I'm actually gonna do now that I'm on a new branch uh, is I'm going to commit that. Uh, and because I am not at all lazy, uh, I'm just gonna do dash A M and uh, and give it a commit message. So, so with, with commit, we covered like that you can commit, but one of the things you can do with git, git commit is there's a lot of uh, parameters on it. One of them is dash a uh, or dash dash add, I think. Don't quote me on that because <laughs> I don't use the long, long ones. Uh, but so dash a will add all of your currently tracked changes uh, into your index and then dash M or dash dash message is the message that you want to give it. Um, and that will just do our commit for us. So now we can do, if we do a git log and just ask for the last one, we see that we just committed uh, and we just gave it the description of harmful because we're following the, uh, the, the guidance of having good commit messages. Um, and that's why it says harmful. Um, but also, uh, when we, so with log, and now I'm realizing I'm jumping all over the place. <laughs> um, but log allows us to, log has a dash dash all, whoops, wait, yes. I 
I bumped the doc. I want to make sure. So one of the things, I'm not going to do dash dash all because I'm not actually at a divergent where I would need it. But um, the, what the log, log can show us in this case, because we have multiple branches, we can see our previous branch, uh, the super cool one. Um, and it, it's still in, um, in our, our uh, history. And so when we, when we launch a graphical interface, um, and now I use Git Kraken, um, which is free for open source, uh, but otherwise a paid one. Um, and I'm just gonna, oh my goodness, user, it's users. Summit demo. Okay. So, it's not going to ask me anything else, is it? Um, so, with the with the in the graphical interface, we can see like this. This is the um, a graphical representation of this same Git log, uh, and we can see the my super cool. Um, if I can make things bigger. Uh, the, our long branch name, I'm getting tired of saying it because <laughs> this is why you shouldn't necessarily make them long, <laughs> especially if you're gonna have to talk about them for a couple of hours. Um, so, uh, words that I have. Um, it's, we can see that like it's, it's still there in it and actually if we, if we check out uh, that one uh, and now if we run git log, we don't see the hello one uh, anymore in, in running just git log from the CLI. Uh, in the graphical interface, we still see that it's here, but we, uh, we also see because of at least the way that git kraken is showing it, um, uh, the check mark is where we checked out to. There's a way to collapse this. So, um, and so, but sometimes we want to run uh, from, or maybe not sometimes, but oftentimes we want to run from the, the command line and we can see the same, or the same with dash dash all. Um, so it shows all, like, the whole log, at least as far as the terminal will show us, and then it starts paging. Um, and in this case, since we only have three, there is no paging, but um, it shows us still pointing the, the head, so where we're checked out to. Um, and then get stash apparently is what we said we're talking about next. So, so in the get stash, um, I'm tired, <laughs> apparently, because uh, there is no hello command, uh, nor did I actually want a hello, hello command. Uh, so if we go back to, if we go back to our hello branch, um, which is much better than the command, uh, and we now make some changes, Notepad script, um, write host. So say we were, we were working on this script for uh, Jeffrey Snover, uh, who at one point, I believe, was, uh, had said write host is considered harmful um, and also had convinced a room full of attendees at Ignite uh, to yell really loudly Mark who when he said Mark Rosinovich, who happened to be across the hall. <laughs> um, and I wish I could have found the video because I wanted to use it <laughs> earlier. But um, so we're working on the script for, for, uh, for Jeffrey Snover, and we've decided that the next thing we're adding to our script is uh, that it's gonna say Mark who. And then Mark comes to us and says, oh, well, I need you to 
drop that and work on something different. Uh, there are a couple of things, ways you can handle the situation. Um, we could commit to our branch as it is and carry on working. Um, we can also use uh, the stash command and um, actually so, uh, to demo the, the stash command, we'll call this Jeffrey. So to demo the, the full power of the stash command, um, say we had, we changed our main script and we had this new Jeffrey script. Um, now, again, we can commit it, um, but maybe, maybe we're not necessarily gonna want it to be called Jeffrey. Um, maybe we're not, it's nowhere near ready um, and we just wanna, wanna switch. Uh, we can run git stash to take what is uh, in the repo or in the repo in the working directory <laughs> and um, and stash it for lack of a better word uh, put it away for later and so we um, by default if you just run git stash uh, it will run uh, git stash add, I think is the, the sub command. Um, but so it, it takes the working directory and the index and uh, applies it into a stash which uh, git kraken um, gives us a night, uh, gives us a way to visualize this. Um, and so we can see that that one is, is there. Um, and then when so we go and do our work for Mark um, and come back and we wanna carry on our work for, for Jeffrey. Uh, and then we can just run, we run git stash pop. Um, so it, the stash is, can be considered a, um, in computer science, it's a heap, I think. I'm hearkening back to my college days, which are Stack, that's the one, I think. It's a, it's a stack, so you last in, first out. Um, so you, they apply on the stack um, to, they basically put a commit on top, on top of it, and then uh, if, you, if you issue the pop command, it will pop it off of the stack and it'll take it, take it off, and assuming it applies correctly, um, it will delete it from the stack. If it doesn't, um, then it'll, it actually stays on the stash. But um, in this case, it works just fine because we haven't actually changed anything. Um, uh, for, for me, one of the, like, uh, what I've actually learned recently with stashes that I, I find powerful is that I can do uh, git stash um, and I can do dash u, which is to stash the untracked changes as well. Um, and so now it's taken our modified script.ps1 and jeffrey.ps1, and they're, on the, they're in their own new, um, new stash, and we can uh, get, go back to our stupidly named uh, branch, and um, now say we want to actually remove that, and git commit, uh, We'll give it at least a half decent. Um, and now when we, um, and another, actually, actually this is, the um, stashes can also be used in, in this scenario where um, you, you've done a bunch of work and realized you're not actually on the branch that you went to be on where you're supposed to be doing the work. Uh, instead of committing it, moving it over, and then trying to bring it all over there, you can just, um, put it onto the stash and then uh, do a git stash pop and uh, bring it off. And this, if I did this right, um, this demonstrates the, the uh, uh, that the pop only deletes when it applies cleanly. And in this case, it didn't apply cleanly because uh, it was deleted, that one of the scripts that we were editing uh, was deleted, and so we have a, a conflict. Um, 
and I'm realizing I'm demoing this and I have no idea how to fix it from the command line. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so in this case, um, we're gonna tell it that we want to delete it and now, um, and, now and then it's applied it, or uh, applied the other change from, uh, from here, which it's not showing. So, um, but clean. Um, I don't know why I wanted to talk about clean this early. Probably because it's not to do with remotes. Um, so with with clean, uh, we use clean to clean the. I hate that the <laughs> that the names for it is is just the easiest way to describe it. Um, but it, it takes your working directory uh, and will will clean it of any um, any files that are not tracked. Uh, by git, uh, and uh, by default, actually, if I recall, it doesn't actually do anything. Yeah. Um, so by default, you actually have to give it uh, what you want it to clean. Um, or, uh, and so with, uh, with dash n, it will just, lit dash n is kind of like dash what if in PowerShell. Um, it'll tell you what it would clean but it won't actually clean it. Uh, and then by default, um, we would then either have to give it I uh, for interactive or F for force. Um, and in this case, so I give it I and it asks me, do I want to clean uh, Jeffrey? Uh, because I've only one file. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll choose to clean that. And now we're back to, um, we got rid of that, that file that was untracked. Um, one of the powers of, of git clean though is that uh, there's x um, and d and I, So um, I run git clean dash xd fn all the time uh, and x cleans the uh, git ignored files, um, which I know I have a slide uh, talking about it later on. Um, in git, you can have a dot git ignore file and you give it the names of files and those files will be uh, completely excluded from git. So, um, so, they, so they won't uh, be include common, common things that you might include in them. Um, and I'm trying to think from a PowerShell perspective, because I'm realizing a lot of a lot of what I do is in, in software. Um, but uh, say your your build process creates an output of your your built module, um, and so you might have your the the output directory. You put it in git ignore so that it doesn't because you don't want your um, your your combined uh, module file to be in source control uh, because it's not, it's not needed to be there because you're not actually making the changes in source control. Um, so you would add it with dot git ignore um, and we might as well actually uh, show it. So if we do git ignore uh, and yes, I want to create that file. And now I'm just going to put jeffrey.ps1 because that was a file that we had used. And I apparently hate working on um, laptop keyboards because I have, a, I have an ergo docs and my, all the keys get moved around. Uh, and so, um, so now we're gonna, uh, Add that, add that git ignore, 
and we're just going to keep a right. Um, so git commit dash a. Um, the great thing, actually, the nice thing about dash a is that it will only take tracked files. So uh, that actually did nothing because I need to uh, git add the git ignore, and then I can commit it. Um, and now if I do uh, copy, copy, okay, fine, new item, jeffrey.ps1. So now when we look, that wasn't supposed to happen. So, my, in your git ignore file, <sighs> um, don't use notepad. <laughs> okay, so the git ignore file, very important, git ignore needs to be called dot git ignore. That's it. Notepad insists on everything having an extension because Notepad. So now, if I do a git status, the gitignore.txt that if I was paying attention up here, I might have noticed. Yeah. If I was paying attention, I would have noticed that, but apparently I wasn't, and neither was my helper. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so with the git ignore, now when we do a git status, uh, we don't see the jeffrey.ps1 now that we've actually done it correctly. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna, add things and commit things, uh, LKJ, because it's easy. Um, but if we look at the directory, we still see jeffrey.ps1. Um, and this is where uh, git clean uh, dash xd um, fn comes in, is that it, would it tells us that it would be removing jeffrey because I think it's the X, and if I'm not mistaken, D is to delete directories if they exist um, and are not being tracked. So, um, so that's where git clean comes in. Slides. Is that, that is, is that then I'm back to slides? Did I leave any, anything for you in this last bit? <laughs> okay, good, perfect. Because I totally, totally remember what I put. So, why are we working, working with remote repositories? Which, which gets us to the, the end, or the, the end goal of using source control, I think, um, at least for me, is to use, um, is to share with, with others and to work with others, especially when using uh, Git, which is a distributed uh, version control system. And so move on into working with the, the remote repositories, um, which is, um, GitHubs or GitLabs. Yeah, GitHubs and GitLabs. Um, uh, it can also be just a directory on on a file share, um, if you wanted. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily do it, but um, but it it can be done. Um, and so, in order to do that, we use the the remote command, uh, which is used to manage a set of tracked repositories. 
Um, an attract repository is just, uh, it's typically a name and a URL reference, URL reference or path, um, whether it's SSH or HTTPS or something, it's, um, it, it configures the way to, to talk to the remote and tell it uh, where to go to get it. Um, and once we have remotes added, this is not the, um, once, once we have a remote, um, it doesn't do us any good to, to keep it on our system. And so we have the git push command, which, which I think this is one of the ones that um, alluded to at the beginning, the, the help of update remote refs along with associated objects. Um, okay, uh, but what are remote refs and what are associated objects? Um, but so git push is used to take uh, what we have on our system and push it uh, and uh, effectively upload it to GitHub, GitLab, um, or what have you. Um, and then once it's, once it's on one of those systems, uh, for us to get it back from, like, so I push it up to GitHub and now I've deleted my, um, I've re-imaged my computer and I want to get it back, um, we use the git clone command, which will clone a repository into a new directory um, so it'll take from that remote and uh, push it up to us. Does yours have this next part? Or um, so uh, once once we've cloned it down, though, what, it doesn't do us any good if uh, so. I say say Ryan makes an update on to our docs repository. Be a perfect example, mm -hmm. and I have a a copy. I'm gonna take a drink. Um, so I've, I've got a copy of the other repository, but, but Ryan here has made changes to it. Um, so I need to get them back on mine uh, some, some way, in some way. Um, and so that's, that's where the git pull command comes in. So git pull, uh, it fetches from and fetch from and integrate with another repository or a local branch is what I actually never noticed the local branch part before. Um, I'm not sure I've ever used that, but um, so, so that's how you would get it from, uh, from the, like the changes on GitHub and get them down uh, to your local copy. However, I'm gonna tell you it's a dangerous command that many people use without understanding the consequences. So git pull um, is, um, it's, it is often referred to and it's often said to use, uh, but, and, and often it works just fine. Um, I would say the majority of the times, you're probably not gonna have an issue. But sometimes you will have an issue. Um, and that's the dangerous part of it, is that those sometimes um, don't come often, but when they do, um, you have to, you, you then have to undo all of that stuff. Um, and so, as Regina George would say, um, stop trying to make pull happen. Um, <laughs> because, um, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'd love to leave it up, but while I, while I actually talk about, about it, but I'll distract myself. So, um, so what pull does um, is it is it fetches the repos the remote repository, and then it takes what those changes that are on that remote repository and tries to merge them with the changes that are on your local repository, um, and where it can um, and partly why I say it's, it's dangerous and I recommend not doing it is that. In that merge, it tries to do the best thing for you, uh, but sometimes that's not the best thing uh, for you. There are there are some settings that can make it safer, or the description of the settings imply that it'll make it safer, but I've never tested them because I just run two separate commands instead. Um, so then, uh, you might, you're probably asking um, if we're not if 
if we're not running get pull, what do we run? Yeah. On so fetch. Yes. As I can't remember what her name in the movie was, but um, so git fetch is the command uh, that I'd argue you should run instead of git pull. Uh, and it downloads objects and references from another repository, but does not try to merge them into your local change. Um, and so this is where we get into the, um, I'm semi glad I prepared. Why is my watch buzzing at me though? Um, oh, wait, okay. Um, so what do we talk, so we start with remote. Yep. Which means, so with remotes, um, we first obviously we need, need a remote. Do. Sorry? We do. Probably the first thing to do would be close down the remote. Well, in, in this case, we already have our changes, right? Yes. Because we, we have this one. Um, so what, we, what we're actually going to do is uh, we're going to go to, uh, in, seriously? <sighs> I swear this worked. Okay. So we're going to go to GitLab. In this case, it's just running on another VM. Um, and we're going to log in and really hope that I remember the password. Um, okay. It's password. I maybe. Um, so one of the reasons that I actually wanted to use this container um, is for security purposes. This VM doesn't actually know any of my uh, login details. Uh, and so the idea is, the idea was gonna be that I could I could clone things from there. That's not the one I want. Um, why did that close? Um, Okay, um, I think this is, or I'm hoping this is a uh, result of me not using my keyboard and actually typing something different on the keyboard than what I'm typing here. Which means, um, which means, can I de demo it or do I need to, do I need to use GitHub? 
Um, let's try. Let's try a new browser and go to GitHub. Well, that wasn't quite right. So I guess we'll use GitHub. Um, and I will just try to be very careful. So to add a remote, um, if we're working with GitHub and GitLab and whatnot, uh, we're gonna want to uh, create new report, or you, you'll typically, in my experience, wanna create the new repository in that, uh, in that remote setting. Um, and so uh, we'll call this, we'll call it Summit Demo before, I think. Uh, and I might as well make it public because why not? Uh, but one of the things I want to make sure, why can't I turn that one off? Okay, uh, no, no. So this should create just an empty repository. Uh, and which means I can copy that. So now uh, to add our remote, um, if we do get remote uh, and just run that, we don't get anything. Uh, so we wanna add our remote. It is, I get think it's just add, add and then we give it the name. Uh, a common, common naming scheme in Git is uh, to use origin as the name of wherever your, your main uh, origin is gonna be. And, and if you do, when you do git clone, uh, it uses origin. Um, so in this case, we'll do git remote add origin, and we're gonna paste the URL that was given to us by GitHub. Um, and now when we run git remote, um, it shows us uh, that we have origin, and we can give it the dash VV, um, and it actually, so in a lot of git commands, you can use the dash V, uh, command to get uh, some verbose output. And in some of them you can do dash VV to get even more Very verbose. verbose. Um, an example of one that gives you something different with VV is branch. Uh, actually, branch isn't gonna give us anything different here. Uh, <laughs> but normally it would, trust me. <laughs> um, normally when you do get branch dash VV and you I say normally, but it, when you have a remote, it will actually tell you the remote that it's tracking against if, you've, um, if you're tracking against that remote. Um, but in this case, it didn't because I don't have a remote yet. So now that I have a branch, we get to the, or not, not a branch, a remote, uh, we get to the git push command, um, which is now when we do git push, um, this is, Gonna be the fun part. Um, so my, my go-to is always to run git push and then always get this message uh, because I created the branch locally uh, and so my remote doesn't know anything about it. So I need to tell git uh, what uh, upstream to use. Um, so in this case, um, so I, I just run the command and then copy it because otherwise I forget the exact syntax, um, and Git tells you the exact syntax every single time, so I figure why not let it do the work. Um, it does, apparently you can tell it to automatically do it, um, but I've never, I've never thought to actually set that up because that would just make my life way too easy, and I am nothing if not a glutton for punishment. Uh, which means I need to figure out how to sign in. Uh, what does the code want for me? Oh, this is handy, I think. Um, can I? Okay. Oh my goodness. Why did it? Uh, Okay, 
So github.com slash login slash device. Device. Enter the code displayed. 212. Um, Oh, uh, I'm not going to unlock that on. <laughs> so, um, handy, I'm, I'm sure everyone's running multi-factor, but if you're not, um, this is a perfect example of why you should be, because why not make it more difficult to log in? But also, there's actually this, there's actual security reasons why you want to anyways, so um, I'm just being facetious about that. Um, so once, so, so now we've pushed up to our branch, um, and uh, I don't even need to log in to, or not our branch, we pushed up to our remote. Um, now, actually everyone can go to github.com slash corebob slash summit demo and see our wonderful, uh, super cool, not at all ridiculously long branch um, as pushed up to that remote. Uh, and, and in fact, um, this sort of gets to the, the other part of the demo, um, if anyone wants to, uh, they can also do the next command, which is git clone. Uh, I'm gonna make a git directory and move in there though. So, um, so if you do git clone, um, git clone summit demo, this will clone it down uh, from the remote and set it up uh, with the, uh, with, with everything that's, that's up there. Uh, in, in this case, there's only one branch because we've only pushed up one branch. Um, but uh, if we wanted to, um, and not, not if we want to, because we definitely want to, uh, I'm gonna go into the summit demo here, and I'm going to check out hello, no. Uh, IPMO posh get. What is, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so now if I do a git push, I can't remember. So again, <laughs> um, so we select it and I just hit right click to copy and paste because that's handy. Uh, we push that up, and um, and now uh, we said we said get pull was kind of the next one, but we also said don't pull because of the of the potentially harmful ramifications. Uh, but what do you do instead? You get fetch. Are you? I think you're doing something with the office clipboard and it's coming through on, I don't know if anyone else noticed in the lower right corner, it said something about, but like, yeah. I think every time you're tapping, it's doing something in PowerPoint. Gotcha. <laughs> I thought I noticed it at one point earlier. And, wow. and anyways, um, so if we fetch it, um, uh, fetch will go out and and get that uh, for us, and so I didn't I didn't show that it didn't exist over here um, before I did the fetch. Um, but we can pretend if I did a git log dash dash all before I did that fetch, uh, this one right here would not exist. Wait, no. 
these ones would not exist, I think. Maybe it's actually just this word that wouldn't exist. <laughs> now that I think about it and where, where I'm actually at on that repository. Um, yeah. Um, So that's fetch and remote. And if I'm looking at the time, we're about 20 minutes, right? Perfect. Because um, I think some of the other, so, so some of the other commands um, um, that I wanted to, discuss but not necessarily demo and go through is, um, uh, we'll call them advanced concepts and commands. Uh, to be aware of, uh, what, I, what I'd recommend with these ones is to um, know that they exist and, um, and kind of keep in the back of your minds like areas where you might need them. Um, and and when you, if you do need them, um, re, like look, um, Look more into them, um, or or look more into them before you actually need them. Uh, in any case, uh, Git cherry pick is one. Uh, it, it allows you to apply the changes introduced by some existing commits. Uh, it is one that uh, can be can be quite powerful, but is also kind of kind of complicated and and can be difficult if you're uh, depending on on um, how far changed your, uh, where you are is to where the cherry pick is coming from. Um, so what cherry pick allows you to do is uh, you have a repository or you have a, a commit in branch A uh, that you want that same, uh, that same change over in branch B. Uh, a perfect example of this is with uh, chocolatey CLI, where we released version uh, two last year, but we still support for commercial customers version one, one point X. Uh, and so if we have any, um, any fixes that we need to make in, um, in either 2.0, 2 point X or one point X, um, we can make that change in the one and, uh, we can potentially cherry pick it in to the other one, um, but this is also where it becomes, uh, it gets complicated and muddy, is that uh, in, in, our, in the case of chocolate CLI, uh, there is a, like it was a large changes that were made. Um, so the code bases have diverged significantly. Um, and so, so you, Cherry pick isn't always the uh, isn't always an option or the best uh, solution, but knowing that it exists and that you can potentially take um, take a commit and pull it over um, is good to know. Um, Git revert allows you to revert some existing commits. Uh, this is very similar to reset in that um, it'll it can take a commit that's there and Basically, it'll just take a commit that's there and do the exact opposite of it. Um, so if if the commit that's there is like the very last commit, you probably just want to use um, reset or um, a reset to um, reset to the commit before that one. Uh, but you can definitely revert to pull that uh, to just uh, invert it um, or well to revert it. It, uh, and in particular, like if you're using, uh, if you're on GitHub and it's like, you've already pushed it up to GitHub on your master branch or something and so you don't want to change the history of it, then revert would be uh, the option there. Um, it's, I don't know, this probably doesn't actually make as much sense as it did in my head, but, um, 
this is the is a a classic uh, Dilbert uh, disaster recovery plan. Um, I just changed it to say Git, and it's um, panic panic because that's usually uh, what you do. Um, Git Git blame uh, shows you what revision and author last modified each line of a file. Uh, this is only it's 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 only a part of it though uh, because it it can tell you when a file was last uh, last modified uh, like each line of that file and who changed it but it doesn't necessarily tell you that that's the person that introduced that line they might have moved that line from somewhere else in the file they might have moved it from another file um, so it's only it only gives you part of the story um, but it's good to know about and to look into uh, if if you need to uh, investigate like where something in a file came from. Uh, Git bisect is uh, amazingly powerful, amazingly complicated, and I have used it professionally three times, I think. Um, but I've, I've given a talk on it. <laughs> uh, so it uses binary search to find the commit that introduced a bug. Um, and this is uh, very good in situations where you, you, you can see a bug exists in one spot, but not in another. Um, and you have ways to reproduce it, but you're not able to, like through, through stepping through things or whatever, you're not able to kind of derive what, what the cause is. Um, it does a search across your code uh, and uh, you just keep telling it, yes, the bug's there, or no, it isn't, until it finds the, the commit that introduced the bug. Um, there are a couple of resources uh, for, uh, for that. Chris, Chris Gardner, um, who's here, did a blog post about get, you, using Git Bisect and PowerShell. Um, and then, as I said, I, did the, I gave a talk last year on using Git Bisect. Um, this is like very much a, uh, as I said, I've used it three times, th three times professionally in like the last five years. But um, knowing that it, knowing that it exists, I think is the like the more important part about it than necessarily knowing how it works. Because knowing that it exists, you can then go and find out how to use it when um, when you're able to to see something like when you run into something that that apparently we inserted the video and told it to play on click um, <laughs> uh, git ref log uh, is another very powerful um, and also incredibly uh, helpful help description of manage ref log information because um, I don't know about you but I know exactly what that means uh, it could actually be because I'm used. But um, so the git ref log is every, every action you take in git uh, logs it into what they call it, what's called the git ref log. Um, so there, in, nothing in git is, or I shouldn't, I won't, it's not nothing. Um, most things in git are almost always um, reversible. Um, some exceptions might be if you if you delete untracked files, um, then you're not necessarily going to be able to get those untracked files back. If you um, delete uh, changed files that you haven't put into your index yet, or maybe not delete, but um, like uh, th if you undo those changes, you might not be able to get them back. But like once something's been put in Git. Uh, you're typically able to work your way back through it. Uh, the ref log can be very helpful in that, but it can also be very confusing and very painful uh, to work through. Uh, git work tree uh, is uh, copy and pasted from the wrong help page. Uh, git work tree is basically branching on steroids. Um, instead of where we were working in a single directory with Git, 
and moving between branches in that same directory. Um, you run the git work tree command and it will create a new, a new work tree or a new directory uh, and check out the branch into that directory. So you can have effectively two copies of your, um, you can have both branches uh, checked out at the same time in different spots on your file system. Um, git merge uh, is join two or more development histories together. Um, I, I found I've, I wanna say I've never used git merge, but I actually have used it occasionally. Uh, but that is at the direction of our release process that tells me to run it and exactly what to run on my computer. Uh, otherwise, I always merge um, in, in GitLab or GitHub, um, and I merge from pull requests in there. So uh, for me, Git merge at the, at the CLI isn't something that you're going to, five, five more people? Five minutes. Five minutes. I guess I got eight. <laughs> um, so so uh, the reason I, di I didn't really cover it is because I find that in day to day, you all, I'm, I'm never get merging locally. Um, I'm always using, using the tooling that's provided by the hosting providers of Git, GitLab, GitHub. Um, those are the two that I use most often, but I believe all the others have merging abilities as well. So, um, and then some, since apparently five minutes, less than five now, uh, I have a slide that I titled Get Good. Um, and just some, some tip, I, I don't know, actually, now that I think about it. Um, this was totally not put in just this morning. We'll just lean into that I wasn't editing everything this morning. Um, but these are actually some, some learnings that I've over in preparing for this. I've, there's always be, always be committing um, or learning. Uh, no matter how much you think you know about Git, you're gonna always learn more. Um, path spec, which I haven't even really, um, got got to cover, but uh, had it in my mind that I wanted to cover. Um, anything that re is referring to a file can be referred to a, through a path spec. So you can do uh, things with path specs like star star slash star dot ps1, and that'll give you all of the ps1 files across your entire repository. Um, and that's where ls files and grep are actually two other git. They're both git commands. Um, and ls files gives you the list of the files that are known to git and only the files that are known to git and um, and grep uh, searches through those files and apparently git grep actually searches through faster than uh, GNU grep and there was another one. Um, so very, very powerful there. Um, some aliases that I wanted to cover but didn't get a chance, apparently. Uh, git, so, so Git can do aliases. Um, and you can use git config uh, alias dot and then the name of the alias uh, and what you want it to be. Uh, these are some of the ones that I have. So I can just do git f and it will abs pull absolutely everything down from all of my remotes. Um, there's git, what's commonly referred to as git log a dog. Um, does git log, it shows everything, it decorates it in one line and gives a graph. Um, and I'm realizing I wanted to show that with the chocolatey one, but, um, and one that I did just added recently is, I don't know how many times I've started, I've typed git in space, and then gone and done something and then come back to it and type git space again. Um, if you set an alias and you put a bang at the beginning of it or the exclamation mark like that, um, it will run that command. Uh, it'll run whatever you tell it to. Um, so in this case, it just runs git. Um, but, um, but 
that brings us into some gotchas. Uh, don't necessarily run every git command that you ever see on the internet, because uh, that's like throwing gas on, you're already messed up. Uh, you might be thinking, well, why do I need git if AI exists? Uh, because according to AI, uh, git branch dash D branch name is uh, did it put to push changes. Um, it's not to push changes. Dash D, dash capital D will delete your branch uh, forcibly and just get rid of it. So you don't want that. Uh, some fetch notes. Uh, please, 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 if you ever have a GUI that says, do you want me to periodically fetch for you? Tell it no. It can get you into trouble. Um, you can use git maintenance start instead. Uh, it's a command you can run on there um, in your repository and it will just, it will fetch it down, but it won't, um, it won't fetch it down is I guess the best way to say it. It'll download all of the stuff that it needs to, but it won't tell, like it won't update git as though it did fetch it. So when you go to fetch it, it just moves some pointers around instead of downloading it again. Um, and everyone else is clapping, so we got to, um, we already covered that one. Uh, we didn't cover hooks, because apparently we don't have time. Uh, but it's a great way to have fun uh, by messing with people. Um, Devin's gonna put developers out of a job by automating things, but we've been automating. That's what I've been trying to do for 10 years. And I still have a job, so. And I was gonna, I was gonna say, if you wanted to learn more, go talk to Mike Kanakis, but Mike's mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <so> thank you. <laughs> and. <laughs>